Yeah, it'll be on YouTube as well. You still cuss on Facebook, right? Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. There's no 10 second delay. No, yeah. there's, no there's no 10 second delay. Welcome to the Poison Pan, everybody on Facebook. Uh, my name's Patrick from the Poison Pan, and I'm really delighted to have uh, a David Joy here with us at the Poison Pan Bookstore. And it's a nice, uh, it's a nice two for one tonight because we have uh, my friend J. Todd Scott, really talented writer. Uh, he has two novels published right now. And I saw the third one scheduled for next June, I think. Yep, that's right. Uh, great writer, and he's going to be uh, kindly volunteered to come in and interview David tonight. So I'm going to hand it over to these guys. There you go. Uh, well, it's great to be here, and uh, people who know me know I'm a huge fan of Dave's. We, we, we've gotten to be kind of friends over the last few years. Um, he's kind of showed me the way in this whole uh, writing journey that we both uh, – Undertaken, and I when when they asked me to come in and, and sit in and talk to you today, I was thrilled to do it um, because I love your work professionally. Uh, you've been a personal friend of mine, and I'm looking forward to talking about uh, not only uh, the most recent book, uh, The Line That Held Us, but the, your other ones before that. So I think now you have a body of work, right? When you get three books, you have a body right. of work. Is that how we look at it? Yeah. All right. So what? Well, do something a little bit different. Uh, I have some questions. I want to get to them. I know everyone here has some questions, but given what you write, how you write, the poetry you bring uh, to the stories that you tell, I think the best introduction, more than anything I could say about you, is to let you read a little bit. So if you're ready for it, why don't you do that? Yeah, I'll do it. I, I told Todd when I when he contacted me, it's. Uh, no, it ain't every day you get interviewed by the DEA. That's right. <laughs> and for somebody like me, that's, that's not a really good thing. I thought, that's man, if this is a trap, <laughs> yeah, I like it this is a sophisticated trap. Yeah. You know, I had the wool pulled over my eye. It is. It is. <laughs> uh, well, I appreciate y'all coming. Um, I'll read the first chapter. The first chapter is about five pages, so it'll take me about ten minutes or so. Uh, but yeah, I think it'll give you a good idea of the book, um, and, and we'll just go from there. Uh, Darl Moody didn't give a wet sack of shit what the state considered poaching. The way he figured anybody who'd whittle a rifle season down to two weeks and not a lot for a single doe day didn't care whether a man starved to death. Meat in the freezer was meat that didn't have to be bought and paid for, and that came to mean a lot when the work petered off each winter. So even though it was almost two months early, he was going hunting. The buck Darl had seen crossing from the Buchanan farm into Coon Coward's woods for the past two years had a rocking chair on his head and a neck thick as a tree trunk. Coon wouldn't let a man set foot on his land on account of the ginseng hidden there, but Coon was out of town. The old man had gone to the flat land to bury his sister and wouldn't be back for a week. The cove was full of sign, rubs that stripped bark off maples and birch, scrapes all over the ground where button bucks scratched at the soil with something instinctual telling them to do so but lacking any rhyme or reason. A mature buck knew exactly what he was doing when he ripped at the ground like he was hoeing a line with his hooves, but the young ones ran around wild. They'd scrape all over the place, trying to add to a conversation they were too inexperienced to understand. Darl locked his stand around a blackjack oak that grew 20 feet high before the first limb sprung off. He climbed to a strong vantage and surveyed a saddle of land where early autumn cast patches of the mountain's gold and afternoon light. An unseasonable cold snap following one of the driest summers the county had ever seen brought on fall a month ahead of schedule. It was the last week of September, but the ridgelines were already bare. Down in the valley, the trees were in full color with reds and oranges of fire like embers, the acorns falling like raindrops. The nights were starting to frost, and within a few weeks, the first few breaths of winter would strip the mountains to their gray bones. Darl sipped a pint of whiskey he had stashed in the cargo pocket of his camouflage pants, took off his ball cap, slipped the sweat from his forehead back through a widow's peak of thin and hair shaped close. He scratched at the thick beard on his chin and listened closely for any sign of movement, though just like the past two evenings, he'd yet to see or hear a thing but squirrels. As soon as the sun sank behind the western face, the woods dropped into shadow, and it wouldn't be long for nightfall. Still, he would stay because there was no telling when that buck might show, and in full dark, he would find his way out by headlamp. 
Somewhere up the hillside, a stick cracked beneath a footstep, and that sound came through his body like current. His heart raced, and his palms grew sweaty, his eyes wide and white. Dried leaves rustled underfoot, and behind the scraggly limbs of a dead hemlock, he could see a slight shift of movement. But from such distance and in such little light, what moved was impossible to discern. Through the rifle scope, he spotted something on four legs, something gray-bodied and low to the ground. The three to nine by 50 center point was useless in low light, but it was all Darrell could afford, and so that was what he had. Sighting the scope out as far as it would extend, he played the shot out in his mind. At 200 yards, the animal filled a little less than a quarter of the sight picture. He rolled the bolt and pulled back only enough to check that around was chambered, then locked the bolt back and thumbed away the safety. A boar hog rooted around the hillside for a meal. Each year, those pigs moved farther and farther north out of South Carolina, first coming up at a Wahala 10 years back and now overrunning farms all across Jackson County. There was open season on hogs statewide due to the damage they caused. Father and son out of Caswell County were hunting private land between Brevard and Toxaway earlier that year when the son spooked a whole passel of hogs out of a laurel thicket and the father drew down on a 700 pound boar. That was right over the ridge line into Transylvania County. That pig weighed 580 pounds gutted and they took home more than 150 pounds of sausage alone. You do the math on that the next time you're at the grocery store. All his life there had been a thoughtlessness that came on before the kill. It was something hard to explain to anyone else, but that feeling was on him now as he braced the rifle against the trunk of the oak and tried to steady his aim. A mind whittled back to instinct. A tangle of brush obstructed his view, but he knew the core lock would tear through that just fine. He tried to get the picture to open by sliding his cheek along the buttstock but the cheap scope offered little play. When the view was wide, he toyed with the power ring to get the picture as clear as possible, nothing ever coming fully into focus as he drew the crosshairs over the front shoulders. He centered on his pulse then, breathed slowly, count the breaths, squeeze between heartbeats on five, pull the trigger. The sight wavered as he counted down, three, two, squeeze. The rifle punched against his shoulder and the rapport hammered back in waves, touching everything between here and there and returning in fragments as it bounced around the mountains. He checked down range and the animal was felled. I got him, Darl said. His body tingled and his head was swimming. Adrenaline coursed through him and left him breathless. He was in disbelief. I fucking got him. Darl sucked down the last of the whiskey in one slug, slung his rifle over his shoulder, and climbed his way down with his tree stand. In less than an hour, the light would be gone. He knew he had to hurry. There'd barely be enough time to field dress the pig and get it out of the woods before dark. Maybe Calvin Hooper would help him dress out the hog. Cal had a nice hoist for dressing deer, and that sure beat the hell out of the makeshift gambling stick Darl had at the house. Whether you were scraping hair or skinning him out, a pig was a whole lot easier with two sets of hands working than one. Cal wouldn't want anything for the trouble, never had. As soon as Darl got that pig back to the truck, he headed to Calvin. I fucking got him, he said. A small branch of water ran at the bottom of the draw and through a thicket of laurel, the hillside steepened. Darl staggered through the copse of trees and slowly climbed until he was near the ledge where the pig had fallen. He tripped on a fishing line strung between two dogwoods, a pair of tin cans with rocks inside clanking loud in the limbs above him. Darl froze and looked around. As his eyes focused, he saw rusted fish hooks hung eye level from the trees, trot lines meant for poachers, and he brushed them back one by one as if he were clawing his way through spider's webs. That's when he saw him, not a pig, but a man, flat on his stomach, a brush pattern shirt was darkened almost black with blood, his pants the same grayish camouflage as his shirt. Darl stepped closer, knelt by the man's legs, and placed his hands on the man's left calf. His body was warm, but there was no movement, no sound of breath. In absolute shock, Darl crawled forward and saw where the bullet had entered the man's rib cage. He'd been quartered away in the hollow point opening as it cut through him and exited behind his right shoulder, blew the top of his arm ragged. The man's left arm hung by his side, his hand open, palm up, and Darl could see a few shriveled red berries balanced at the tips of his fingers. He 
He realized then that he was kneeling in a thick patch of ginseng, mostly young two-pronged plants, but some much, much older. The man had an open book bag on the ground beside him with a tangle of thick banded roots stuffed inside. The thin runners off the main ginseng shoots snarled like a muss of hair. Darl knew the man shouldn't have been there the same as him. This was coward land and they were both trespassing. Two poachers who shouldn't have been there, but right there they were, there they were, one of them gone from this world and the other suddenly facing it in all of its enormity. While he crouched there on hands and knees, dumbstruck as a child, his mind washed between astonishment and terror. The man's face was turned and angled into the ground. His neck was sunburned and dotted with dark orange freckles, the back of his hair thick and curled, a yellow blonde the color of hay. Darl stepped across the body, being careful not to get his boots in the blood around him. The man wore a camouflage hat with hunter orange lining the edge of the bill, the words Caney Fort General Store stitched across the front. The hat was not crooked on his head, and Darl grabbed the bill to try and turn the man's face out of the dirt. As soon as he saw the dark purple birthmark covering the right side of the man's face, Darl knew him. Carol Brewer, who everyone called Sissy, lay stone cold dead on the bracken laced ground. Darl had known Carol all his miserable life, a half-wit born to a family that Jesus Christ couldn't have saved. Some people believe Carol's daddy Red might have been the devil himself. There was a meanness that coursed through him, a meanness that was as close to pure evil as any God-fearing man had ever known. Carol was the run of the family and by most accounts the only one who ever had a chance. Some thought if he'd been able to get out from under the wings of his father and older brother Dwayne, he might have been all right, but things didn't work out that way, and Carol wound up being just as much trouble as the lot of them. Darl let go of the cap bill, and Carol's head came to rest on the ground. His eyes were closed with his mouth slightly open. A yellow jacket buzzed by Darl's ear and landed on Carol's lips. The wasp started to crawl into his mouth, but Darl swatted the bug away, his fingers brushing Carol's face. He stomped the bee where it hovered above the ground, then looked to the west to gauge what light remained. Darl knew it wouldn't be long, though nightfall didn't matter like it had just minutes before. His thoughts were wild with what would come, but he knew the darkness was a gift now and he welcomed it as such. His mind raced as the night slowly closed around him like cupped hands. He had until dawn to dig a grave. I mean, they often talk about a writer developing their voice and um, I think rarely has an author's real voice and his literary voice tracked so closely together. Now I can't read any of your books and not hear you reading them, right? Uh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but before we talk about the specifics of, of the book, I want to talk about imagery a little bit. I mean, we've heard the lyricism, we've heard the poetry, but you've often said um, that your books start with an image. Uh, where all light tends to go, uh, you had an image of a boy and, and a hog killing, right? Yep. Um, what image grabbed you or propelled you for the line that held us? Well, it was that image of, uh, of Darl Moody standing over, over this body uh, and recognizing that he, he just killed a man. Uh, and really, I, th I think maybe this is the first time that the image uh, didn't kind of arrive out of just nowhere. Uh, usually, my brain just kind of makes the things up. This time, it was actually an event that really happened in a neighboring county, in Macon County, where I live, and uh, out by a place called Standing Indian. And this guy was deer hunting on his land, uh, and he saw what he believed to be a pig, and he fired. Uh, and when he got up to it, it was a Hispanic man digging, he was poaching Gaelic off of his property. And so uh, a game warden told me about this. And, and uh, in real life, the man didn't face any charges because he was on his property. You know, uh, it was just an accident. It was just bad luck. Uh, but I think I'd, you know, I'd sat and thought about that and then kind of twisted it and turned it on its head. Uh, but yeah, that was, the, that was the initial image. It's safe to say from the, the small bit that you read that things don't go well ultimately uh, for Darrell, uh, his friend Calvin, uh, Calvin's girlfriend Angie, 
Um, they come into contact with something of a force of nature, I guess, uh, which is Dwayne Brewer, Sissy's older brother. Um, and, and I think initially he is comes across as a villain. And you, you've had some quote-unquote villains in your other books. You had Jacob McNeely's father in uh, Light, uh, Doug Dietz in Wait, um, and now, I guess, Dwayne Brewer here in um, uh, Line. But, you know, Gabino Iglesias, I think, pointed out that after he got done reading this book, he had to think hard about who's a protagonist and who's an antagonist. Do you see Dwayne as cut from the same cloth as some of these other kind of monstrous or villainous or, or, or violent characters that you've portrayed in your other books? Because I don't, yeah. but I'm curious how you see him. Well, I think, uh, I think I very much, this book really became Dwayne's story, uh, you know, and, and so I think he's the most interesting character in the book. I think he's an unforgettable character. Uh, and really, you know, I was thinking about like all the, all the, know antagonists or bad guys that I love most and I was thinking about like Lester Ballard in McCarthy's Child of God I was thinking about like Granville Sutter uh, in William Gay's Twilight I was thinking about Flannery O'Connor's Misfit uh, you know I was thinking about all of these uh, these bad guys and my favorite parts of those books are the moments where uh, you find yourself agreeing with them or you find yourself nodding your head at what they do. So, so Flannery O'Connor's, you know, a good man is hard to find. You read that short story, everybody wants that old woman to shut the hell up. Uh, you know, everybody in the car wants her to shut up. Everybody reading the story wants her to shut up. We've all been beside her. I was beside her on the airplane today, and I needed a misfit to put a gun to her head and say, you know, be quiet. Um, but I thought about those those moments where you know, uh, where you where you agree with them. Uh, so like Lester Ballard in Child of God, it's that moment where he goes to the carnival and he's trying to win this stuffed animal, which he's taken back to a dead body uh, that he's in he's in love with this woman and she's dead and he's keeping her in an attic. So there's that. Uh, <laughs> but he's trying to win this stuffed animal to take back to her, and he's trying to do it at a shooting gallery, and he's got his own rifle. He's very much a marksman, and the guy won't let him shoot his own rifle. The guy hands him this beat-up rifle with a bent, you know, you know, a bent barrel and a bent sight, uh, and he hands it to you. And we've all been there. Uh, we've all had the guy try to hand us the shitty rifle, and uh, Lester wears it out. You know, he wears it out. He wins this stuffed animal, and there's this moment of, of victory there. Uh, I think I was interested in that. Um, you know, and so with Dwayne, uh, there are a whole lot of moments in this book where I hope that a reader, uh, you know, finds themselves, uh, you know, on his side. And, and so, you know, I, the second the second chapter, I think, pretty early on, sets up kind of his moral code, uh, and that that was very much an insight from from our editor. Help me get that right, uh, but I hope there's moments where where you, you know, where you pull for Dwayne, uh, and at the end I hope you're pulling for Dwayne. Yeah. Well, I think that you know I, I, you know, I picked out a, a kind of a Dwayne moment uh, kind of midway through the book. You know, all his life he felt the responsibility to shield his younger brother from harm, to ensure that he took the brunt of whatever pain this world dealt, because he was tough enough to bear it. Whether it was standing between Sissy and her father when Red Brewer grabbed a glass gallon jug or an iron fire dog to swing, or shoving Sissy in the closet when one of Red's drinking buddies wandered into the boys' bedroom late at night to crawl in bed beside them, Dwayne Brewer had taken everything he could out of the deepest love he'd ever known. That's because Dwayne was strong enough to take it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's exactly right. Uh, and that's also, you know, that's the main. The main idea of the book, uh, you know, there's a moment towards the end of the book uh, where Dwayne asks one of the characters, uh, you know, for whom are you willing to lay down your life? Uh, outside of that, there is nothing. And I think that's the central question of the, of the novel, uh, is, 
is who are you willing to die for right this minute? Uh, and, and who's willing to do that for you? I, I was very interested in that kind of love. And uh, for Dwayne, it's clear from the beginning. Uh, you know, it, it, it was his, his brother, uh, and, and he loved his brother. Uh, and he felt a responsibility to always protect his brother, and, and I think that's what eats him alive is that he couldn't, uh, you know, and that this has happened. What, I mean, I, I talked at the beginning a little bit about kind of your body of work. Right? Like I said, you, you have these three books. Um, they cross-pollinate. I mean, they're not a series, but, but they touch on each other. Um, you know, they're kind of the Jackson County books, right? That's where they're all set in Jackson County, North Carolina. What line do you think ties all of these books together? readers coming to these books, what can they expect from all of them? What, what do you think they all share in similarity? Other than place, which is very which is very definite. Uh, how do you see your body of work? Is it is it reflective of, of of this place? Is it reflective of a theme? Is it are you trying to say something about uh, where you live and where you were born? Yeah, no, I, I'm not trying to say anything about that place. Uh, you know, I think the reality of that place where it appears in the work is, is a lot more nuanced. I think it's, it's in the background. Uh, you know, the details are right. Uh, you know, and, and so in the background, I think there's a very nuanced truth uh, that is very representative of the place where I live, Jackson County. The types of stories I'm trying to tell uh, you know, no, I'm not trying to say anything about Jackson County any more than I think Donald Ray Pollock was trying to say something about Southern Ohio or Daniel Woodrell was trying to say something about the Ozarks. Uh, and, and so I think I'm telling a very particular type of story. Um, I think each one has had its own kind of thing. You know, I think that first, that first novel was very much kind of uh, about uh, that balance between hope and faith. Uh, you know, wishing that you could get out of some place, but knowing that you never will. I think that book was kind of about that. I think that second book was very much uh, a treatise on violence and a treatise on trauma. Uh, this book is is very much about what I just what I just said in, in, in that trying to understand uh, you know that type of love, the type of lay down my life love. Uh, but yeah, I do think there are things that that, uh, you know, arise over and over and over. Uh, and, and so there's often father and son relationships. Uh, there's often ideas of, uh, of masculinity, uh, you know, uh, what it means to be a man. Uh, you know, somebody asked recently about uh, the women. And in their mind, the women, uh, they said the women lacked faculty and, and what was amazing to me was it's like no the women have or lacked agency excuse me uh, and, and it was like no the women have more agency in the novels than the men in every novel uh, and I, you know all of my friends say the same thing uh, the men are the ones who are trapped uh, you know very much in, in these uh, in these traditional roles of, of this is what you have to do uh, that's often a central conflict. Um, yeah, I don't know that I set out to write about those things. I think maybe that happens more organically, you know. And I, and I, I never know what a book's about until I'm done. Uh, so I didn't set out to write a book about, you know, um, you know that idea of love. Uh, and then when I finished the draft, it was like, oh, you know, it's like, oh, that's what this book's about. Well, speaking of, you know, then in your books kind of feeling the most trapped or kind of having these roles defined for them. Uh, the LA Times, in a great review they did for you recently, argued that um, you know Dwayne's kind of the quintessential negative Appalachian stereotype. I'm yeah. sure you don't agree yeah. with that. But do you feel that sometimes you have to lean in? Do you feel that some of these characters do perpetuate that stereotype because that because there's a truth to it because it is yeah. what it is because you have to lean into that because that's that's how the you know the Dara Moody's and the Calvins and the McNeely's from you know from the other book I mean are they are who they are because that is who they are yeah 
Yeah, I think I, there was a. I was conflicted uh, there, and, and I think it's. I think it's two things. Uh, so one, there was a comparison drawn between a book of nonfiction and a book of fiction, uh, and I don't. Th I don't believe that's a fair comparison to make. Uh, you know, if, if you want, if you want me to write about Appalachia, then read my nonfiction. Uh, I've been pretty clear and I've been pretty adamant about the complexity of that place. Uh, particularly in my in my nonfiction, uh, you know, I'm writing about these types of characters because that's the type of story I want to tell. Number one, but also because that's the type of people I've known all my life, uh, and and it's certainly not that those people aren't there. Uh, you know, I last week there was a guy standing in front of my house, uh, a heroin addict, looking to buy heroin. You know, he was looking for, where's Nightingale? Where's Nightingale? Nightingale's this road up, up, the, up the dirt road from me, just up the side of the mountain. Uh, and so these people are here, and, and if you don't believe that they're there, come to my house and I'll show them to you. Uh, but I've also been pretty clear that that's not uh, any more indicative of place than it is here. Uh, anybody who's from, uh, you know, Phoenix, certainly you, could drive me around and show me these people, and it's and it's you know uh, that's one side of Phoenix, and so I think I've always been pretty clear in saying if you want any type of real understanding about Appalachia, uh, you know read everything. Uh, so so if you want to read my work, great, uh, but read Robert Guyth and and read Crystal Wilkinson, uh, you know read Rebecca Gilhow, read Ron Ranch, read uh, Silas House, you know read Frank X Walker. There are all of these voices. Uh, telling very different types of stories, and all of them are true. And so I think there's that. And the other side of it, I think, is, uh, you know, and maybe it's selfish, uh, but I feel like if I can go to the darkest places imaginable and I can still find humanity, uh, then, there's, then I, there's a piece of me that remains hopeful. Uh, if I can go to the darkest places imaginable and make you feel empathy, that leaves very little room for dehumanization. Uh, you know, and I think maybe that's the the biggest role of fiction is is that George Saunders idea that that prose, when it's done well, fiction, when it's done well, can serve as uh, empathy's training wheels. And and so uh, if you think about it like that, uh, you know, I think maybe that's one of the things that I'm that I'm trying to do. The last time you were here, uh, you were here with, I believe, John Sanford. Yep. Right. And um, the HB cast had a great discussion, and one of the things that came up was this role, this idea of the role of a, a writer as entertainer. Yeah. Right. And, and he, and he uh, said very clearly, you know, he writes, you know, his books as entertainment. Do you see that as a writer's role, or is it? Can you? Is it mutually exclusive? Can you be both an educator and an entertainer at the same time? Yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm trying to tell a very entertaining story. I, I, I mean, at the end of the day, I think that's one of the things that I do well. I think uh, you know, I can make a story move. Uh, there's propulsion in my stories in the same way that I think there's propulsion in Daniel Woodrell. Uh, you know, you pick up Tomato Red, and and you're through that first chapter and into the second before you take a breath. Uh, that type of propulsion has always interested me. Um, at the same time, you know, yeah, I, th I think I'm doing something very different than John, and I don't, you know, uh, he said very clearly that, that what he wanted to do, he was working in newspapers, uh, and what he said was, uh, I decided I wanted to make as much money as I could off of writing. He said, I'm, I set out to write these books. To you know, I, I saw the books that sold, and I thought I can do that. And he did, uh, and he's been incredible at it. Uh, I don't think that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, and if that is what I'm trying to do, then I damn sure ain't very good at it. Because you know? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm certainly never going to sell as many as many copies as John. Uh, you know, but but no, I, I think uh, I think I. You know, like I said, I, I wanted that second book. I don't think very many people understood that second book at all. Uh, you know, I wanted that book to be a treatise on violence and trauma. Uh, I think very few people understood that. Uh, and, and that's, you know, maybe that part of that's my failure. Uh, you know, and, and, 
you know, but I, I don't know. As a writer, as an artist, does that frustrate you when you feel like someone didn't quite get what you were going for? I mean, I know it does me, yeah. right? Yeah. But how do you, you know, deal with that when you think, I, I had a point and they just didn't quite get it? Yeah. Uh, well, with a book like that, um, that book is very dark. And I think a lot of readers are unwilling to go to those types of places. Uh, and I understand that. You know, my books are not for everybody. Um, at the same time, I read something recently where someone said, you know, I couldn't relate to the characters in this book. And it was like, why? why since when is that a requirement of literature uh, to, to identify with the characters? My favorite books, I, hell, I don't identify with any of them. Uh, you know, you know, I read, you know, uh, I always talk about him, but Chigozi Obiyama, uh, he's got a new book coming out next year. He's Nigerian. I said, what the hell do I know about that? You know, I, I never left North Carolina. Uh, I love his books uh, in the same way that I loved Jose Saramago's book, books, in the same way that I love Gabino Iglesias' books. Uh, and, and so I think there's that, you know, that boggles my mind. Um, at the end of the day, I, and I've, this is a, a more recent thought that I've been having, but I think that humans uh, largely have an aversion to ambiguity. Like I think that, uh, you know, they always want something to be this or they want it to be that. Uh, it has to be black or it has to be white. It cannot be gray. It's as if uh, it's as if they cannot. If I cannot compartmentalize something into one of two categories, then my brains will ooze out of my ears. Uh, and as an artist, that's incredibly frustrating uh, because as an artist, you're painting the wall gray. If you you know that's the that's the best color you got. Uh, and so with a character like Dwayne, he's very much it's it's a matter of gray. Uh, and yes, that's very frustrating. And at the same time, I've read I've read studies. Uh, I've, you know, I read a study where they were trying. Ultimately, they were looking at mental illness in creatives. Uh, so they were looking at, at instances of mental illness, in, particularly in writers. Uh, and one of the things that they found was exactly that 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 writers and that artists, for the most part, have a have a much more uh, broad acceptance of of. Uh, ambiguity and and one of the failures of that uh, from an evolutionary standpoint is that we can't make decisions uh, so as whereas somebody who's who can see something as black and white it's like oh well we do this you know and they they, they just you know jump right in whereas I'm sitting there and thinking ah, let's think about this for a second and then we don't get shit done and then we go drink <laughs> beer uh, you know, uh, and so yeah I, th I think there's a lot of things going on but that that inability to look at the world with ambiguity is incredibly frustrating uh, to me. Yeah, I, I know that I feel in my own books that a lot of times there are conversations or, or arguments with myself, right? That I can write a, a, a point of view of one character and then argue the complete other side of it, you know, later in the book. Um, of course, I'm also have a, you know, I'm a lawyer. Uh, that's my background. Uh, and that's what lawyers do all the time, so yeah. I guess that's part of it. Yeah. Uh, I want to open it up here to questions, but first I want to read another line uh, from a book. And um, just I want your take on this line. All right. Uh, this isn't scripted, so he doesn't know what I'm about to read. All right. All right. Uh, Calvin knew the story the same as everyone else to ever come out of Jackson County. Things had a way of never leaving these mountains. Stories took root like everything else. He was part of one now, part of a story that would never be forgotten, and that made bearing the truth all the more heavy. Just as Dwayne told him the night before, a man's mind is its own kind of hell. So this idea that stories take root like everything else. You tell me about that. I think that's particularly true where I live. Uh, and so, so where I live, because of how isolated it is, uh, you know, both both by landscape, uh, both by culture and, and uh, familial ties, story has a way of 
really, really holding to a place. Uh, and so, um, you know, I think I'm playing with that idea. And part of it is, is like uh, when something happens, you, you don't have the same separation that you have in a city. Like you're one degree away. And so like something happens on the news and even if you don't know that person, it's like, oh, well, you know, his sister's my hairdresser. Oh, I go to church with his aunt. Uh, you know, they, there's one degree of se separation. And so I think that's part of it. Um, and then, yeah, it's this idea that story holds there. And so, for instance, uh, you know, there was a murder that happened in the 70s in a place called Little Canada where that second novelist said, Jess, uh, Jess Brown was the woman's name. <laughs> People still don't talk about that, uh, and and I mean kids, I mean children know that story, uh, you know, and they weren't even alive, uh, you know. That story just holds there, uh, you know. There's a there's a story that's mentioned in here of the Silva Seven, uh, which is a true story. Uh, anybody who's from there remembers that story, and they'll never forget it. Uh, I can when I really started to conceptualize, I think, that idea, uh, I was, I'm real good friends with a bunch of firemen and police officers. Uh, and most of my friends are older than me. Most of them are in their 60s. Uh, and, but anyways, I hopped in the fire truck and I rode with these guys to a, to a fire call and it was a wreck in a curve in a place called Sapphire. And uh, off the side of the road was the Horse Pasture River. And one of them got to talking about his like That's where that deep hole is. Uh, and he looked at the other person, and and he said, do you remember that wreck there that night? And he was like, oh, yeah, I remember that wreck there that night. And they were started talking about something that had happened there 40 years before. And they were, they were talking about it like it had just happened. Uh, and, you know, I was thinking about how young they must have been. But I remember one of the lines, this guy named Hammer, uh, Greg Fowler, Everybody calls him Hammer. He said, uh, I never thought they would quit bringing out the bodies. And it was this, uh, it was a, like a church band uh, that went in this river and all these children drowned. Uh, but it was the idea that standing here in this spot, I know the history of this place. Uh, that, that land uh, becomes this sort of capsule for story. Uh, and where I live, I think that's very much true. Uh, and, and so I think in a lot of ways, I want the fiction to reflect that. Uh, you know, I don't know that it matters to people outside of that place, but it matters to me. And I, th and I think to people who are from there, that's what I mean about that nuanced truth. Uh, you know, they would recognize that as this is our reality. No, I, since I started writing, you know, I've gotten to meet a lot of authors and have had the pleasure of sitting up here and talking to um, several of them. And uh, without a doubt, you're one of my favorites. And um, every time one of your books comes out, you're one of the few writers. I mean, we're all self-conscious. We all, you know, uh, shift between thinking we're great and we think we suck. I spend a lot of time on the I, I suck part of the, the spectrum. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> But every time one of your books comes out, um, it's, I get it immediately and I start breaking it down because I love the way you approach writing, I love the way you approach language, and I try to learn um, from how you do it. You talk about your stories being compulsive, and I think they are. Um, you know, I, I think songwriters are great because they tell huge stories in a very compressed format. If you, if you listen to a song by Tracy Chapman or somebody, I mean, they tell these real stories over, you know, verse, chorus, verse. And I've always wished to be able to do that, too. I can't write a song with the dam. And I don't write short. Uh, you and I talk about this a lot. Um, you know, your book, The Line to Hell Us, is a prologue for one of my books, right? I'm just getting, <laughs> I'm, I'm just getting wound up by the time you're wrapping it up. Uh, but one of the things that I've tried, to, I'm a lingerer. Um, I stay long past my welcome. One of the things that I try have, have tried to do since you and I have become friends and since I've really started to study writing is try to find a way to compress, to say more uh, with less. And you know, if 
finally have a book under 400 pages, which everyone will be thrilled with. Um, <laughs> but, it, you know, it, it's been great talking to you. I mean, we've had some of these conversations before. Uh, the line that held us is great. It's another uh, great addition to your body of work. That now, once you get three books, you've got a lot. Awesome. Um, and <laughs> I don't know if that's right or not, but I'll take it. <laughs> and I, right, and I can't wait uh, to, to see the next one. And maybe you can talk a little bit about what you got coming next. But I'll open it up to some questions and let some other people uh, have their shot at you. Yeah. You mentioned the murder from the 70s. I think, was it a man or a woman? Jess, someone? Jess Brown. Yeah. Jess Brown, okay. Yeah. And you said that that story just held. I mean, it just held. What does that mean? I mean, do people not want to talk about that particular murder? What? Yeah. Does it feel uh, yeah. superstitious well, about it? Well, I think they. Well, I think they do talk about it uh, because it's still known. Um, but it's very. You don't bring that type of thing up in mixed company. Uh, mixed you know, when it, when that the guys who did it, it was these two two people who murdered her in her barn. And uh, when they when they went uh, to prison, they died in prison. Well, after, when, after that, uh, you know, when they died, the family claimed the body, uh, and they wanted to bring them back to Little Canada and bury them in their family cemetery. And they would not let that happen uh, to the point that blood would have spilled. Like they they blocked their they blocked that road. You cannot bring that body. Uh, you know, and that, you know, that's probably 30 years or more after. Uh, and so that's, you know, I think it's that. Uh, or, you know, in, in the way of this world, there's a, there's a scene really early on, uh, you know, when I say that things exist, I mean down to the tree. Uh, when I put somebody under a tree, oftentimes I know where he is. I know where that tree is. And there's a tree in, in the opening of, o opening of that book uh, where Aiden McCall is sitting there and he's, he's scribbling his name in cursive with a stick and Dad Broom comes up to him. That tree exists. Uh, and there, there's a part in there where it talks about uh, people there had always believed that there was a body buried under that tree. That story's true. Uh, you know, not that there's a body buried there, but that people have always been told that and that they believe that. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I think there's a folklore to to places that, uh, that yeah, just just holds there. Maybe in a way uh, that does not happen in cities. I don't think. Uh, you know, you've got uh, yeah, number one. You've got a twenty-four hour news cycle. But to be honest, you have less than that. You've got morning news and nightly news, and by then you forgot. Uh, and the, and that there's that all of that separation uh, between you and and what's happening. And it, it, that's not how it is where I live. Thanks for your suggestion of the reading. But now I'm going to have to go back and reread the first two so I can hear them in the proper voice. <laughs> I told Ray Brown the same thing many years ago when I heard him read. I'm also very impressed with the breadth of your reading and your retention of details in it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it means a lot to hear that name. Only thing about reading it in my voice is it's going to take you forever. <laughs> so be it. Yeah. I joke. I joke. When people always say, a lot of times when I finish a reading, they say, "Well, you should do the audio books." And it's like, man, it'd be a damn three hundred hour audio. <laughs> <laughs> I'll read I'm stuff. already a slow reader. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know yeah. what? The pace that you read at. I'm sorry. The pace you read at was perfect because it, we were soaking up all those details and all that that scenery and setting. And tone and, and everything, it allows us to, to just really breathe that in yeah. at the rate that you did read it. It was yeah. perfect. Thank you. I liked how when you were describing the, the wasp that was on his lips and then he, he described it as a bee and a yellow jacket because it, yeah. it showed me that the guy was not sure because his mind isn't clear yeah. and so it was good, it was like a little confusing that I would like the way you three, three different insects. I think, the, I think what I love most about that moment is the humanity of it. Uh, is that he just killed this guy, uh, 
You know, and that happens very quickly in the woods. So like, you kill a deer, by the time you get to a deer, there's yellow jackets on it. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, the idea that he didn't want anything to happen yeah. to her, uh, I don't know that that necessarily comes across, but I think that's what I like most about that one. Yeah, I was just going to ask, um, I, you, must, you must be a poetry reader. Who are some of the poets that you like? So I just got this, and I'm not going to be able to remember the name. Uh, I just got this book of poetry last night. I was at Watermark in, in Wichita, Kansas, and they oh. gave me this uh, collection by a Kansas poet, a black Kansas poet. And he's the editor at the New Yorker, a poetry editor at the New Yorker. But I don't know, I can't remember his name. But anyways, I started reading these, these poems today. Uh, and they're wonderful, uh, but it's the, it's the images. So he had this image, and I'm gonna I'm gonna screw it up, uh, you know, because I'm not a poet. But it it's this image where this guy threw water out into this crowd at a ball game, and it was it was something about this moment of, uh, of tears turning into confetti. Uh, but the way he said it, it was like. It was gorgeous. It was gorgeous. I just want, I wanted to steal it. Uh, or like I ran across this other phrase. Now this it this wasn't this wasn't a poem. It was uh, fiction. It, and it was Chigozi Obiyama. But it was an image that was poetry. And he said that he said that uh, the guy wanted uh, he wanted to break the legs of the day. Uh, he did not, and so in other words, he did not want uh, the day to continue. He wanted to break its legs so that it stopped. Uh, that type of image interests me. Uh, you know, some of my favorite poets, uh, that's exact. that's a Kevin Young uh, is, is the Kansas poet. Uh, and, but that collection I was reading, it's called Brown, uh, and it's, it's gorgeous. It just came out, I think, earlier this year. But some of my favorites, uh, I love... I love when somebody captures the same types of things I'm writing about. And so a writer like Ray McManus in South Carolina, I, God, I love his work. I, I stole an image from him, and I told him I was going to do it. I was like, man, I'm stealing this. Uh, and I turned it on its head, but Ray McManus, he had this collection called Punch. Uh, he had a collection called Red Dirt Jesus that I love. Uh, there's a Kentucky poet named Rebecca Gale Howe that I've talked about a lot. Uh, she had a collection come out last year called uh, American Purgatory that I enjoyed. But the collection of hers that I'm in love with uh, was called Render and Apocalypse. Uh, and it's gorgeous. Uh, it, it, it's just gorgeous. Uh, Maurice Manning, I, I love Maurice Manning. Uh, I love Frank X. Walker. Uh, a poet that's really old that uh, you know I always find myself going back to is H.D. Uh, Hilda Doolittle. Uh, I go back and I read I read those poems in trilogy, uh, and I love that. Uh, I, I think really early on I, I was really in love with Walt Whitman. Uh, you know, for a long time, uh, and part of that, you know, part of that was that. Early on, I didn't read books. I was not a voracious reader as a child. I can count the number of books that I loved on on two fingers as a child. I loved I loved uh, you know Gary Paulson's Hatchet, and I loved uh, Walter Dean Meyer's Fallen Angels. Those are the only two books that, as a kid, that I fell in love with. And I think largely I just wasn't handed the right books. And so really, I didn't fall in love with literature until later. Uh, but I was in love with music, and so, and in that exactly what Todd was talking about, you know, that ability to constrain it. Uh, you know, I've talked about this a lot, but I think that a, uh, I think that a poem, a short story, a novel, an essay, whatever the form is, I think that they all have to weigh the same thing. Uh, and so, like, if a novel has to weigh a hundred pounds, uh, then a poem also has to weigh a hundred pounds difference is that I've got, you know, 250 pages to do it. Uh, they've got, you know, 20,000 
20 lines, uh, but then, the, you know, they can do it in six lines uh, or, or less. Uh, I, I, I can remember the first time I read this poem by a writer named Aaron Smith, uh, and it was in a collection called Appetite. And uh, he was talking about growing up gay in a, in a, a fundamentally Christian household. And there was this line in it. Uh, his mother used to beat him uh, with a belt trying to, I guess, beat the gay out of it. But there's this line in it where all it said was, she loved Jesus that much. Uh, and the first time I read it, it shattered me. He shattered my world in a line. Uh, you know, and I think that's what I love about poetry is, is that ability to, uh, is that ability to just do it in an instant. Uh, you know, I'm reading along and then just I'm broken, uh, or I'm reading along and then I'm laughing, or, or whatever. Uh, that, I love that, and you, I love the image, the imagery of it, just the music of it. Right. Do you think that I know you're a Cormac fan? You say. Yeah. Do you think that kind of lang, lang, landscape suggests or inspires language? Uh, I'm just thinking about. Now I'm a big Cormac fan too, and you know, his early stuff, which is you know, in the kind of the deep south, and um, you know, very ornate, very lush, yeah. kind of Faulknerian language. Yeah. And then he comes down to the border, and it becomes very spare. Yeah. You know, uh, equally, uh, very interesting. You know, how, how how language and landscape are so intertwined. I th well, I think I think that's largely dependent on writer. Uh, and so a, a lot of writers who are writing about a city, it is a lot more spare and it's a lot faster. But then I think about a writer like Colin McCann uh, and a novel like Dancer, uh, you know, or Let the Great World Spin, which is very much a New York novel. I mean, he said very specifically he wanted to write a post 9-11 New York novel about what New York had always been. Uh, and that everything he writes is music uh, you know every sentence every sentence is its own uh, song uh, I got one time I saw him read and it was at this uh, it was at a university it was a huge huge you know auditorium everybody had to be there all these students had to be there you know their teachers are like don't come to class you got to go to this whatever so the whole place was filled, and it was a bunch of students that didn't want to be there. No seats, and so I sat against the back wall, and I couldn't even see them. Uh, all I could see was the backs of these kids' heads. And they were uh, looking at their phones, they were talking, they were laughing, they were not paying any attention to him. And uh, I was paying attention to every, everything he was saying, but there came a moment where these, these two kids at the same exact time their heads started going like this. They, they were not conscious of it. Uh, they were just moving. And it, it was clear as day they were dancing to what he was reading. His language carried so much reader or meter and, and so much just, uh, there was music to it that their bodies could not help but move. Uh, and so, I love writers like that, and for him, he's writing about New York City. So I, th you know, I think if yeah, but he's an Irishman, so <laughs> yeah, that, well, yeah, that is true. That is it, true. It comes yeah. in the blood, right? Yeah, yeah. Sebastian so. Barry is another guy like that. Do you know his stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, really no. good. Yeah. yeah. Well, also, Todd, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what we can expect next year? Uh, well, uh, I my the third book in uh, my. My, I guess that makes it my body of work at that point, right? <laughs> uh, Big Ben series comes out. It's called This Side of Night. It comes out around uh, June or, or July, uh, I think. Uh, and then after that, uh, I have a standalone book, uh, also set in Texas. Um, but that's completely different than, than the other things. Um, and I'll be interested to see uh, what people think about that. But curiously enough, Dave and I both have something coming out together uh, next year. And he was nice enough to, to uh, 
kind of asked me to be involved in it, and you want to talk a little bit about the, the anthology that you've got yeah, coming out yeah. next year? Because that's, that's unique, and uh, I think it's, it's got great writers. I'm not one of the great writers. I would lucky enough to be with the great writers. Shit. But um, why don't you yeah. talk about that? He's got a gorgeous essay in that collection. Uh, well, so, so I was sitting one day fishing. I, that's the only thing I'm good at. Uh, I can write a half-assed novel, but I can fish. Uh, like you, if you put me by water, I will. I can catch fish. I don't care what the water is. Uh, you know, I'll say, yeah, I can write a decent sentence, but I can fish. But so anyway, I was fishing one day, and I started thinking about uh, all of these really great fishing charities, and uh, I was thinking about like the work they do. And there was a part of me that really wanted to do something for this for charity, but I'm poor. So, <laughs> so it's like, well, I can't give them any money because I ain't got any money. Uh, but it was like, I have a whole lot of really, really talented friends. Uh, and all of these friends know how much I love fishing. So really, if you want to get me excited, you start talking to me about fishing. So I knew the people who had fished. Uh, a writer like C.J. Box, for instance, who loves fishing. Chuck loves fishing. Uh, but so I reached out to all these people uh, seeing if they might write an essay for this collection. And, and amazingly, I got 25 incredible writers. Uh, you know, a third of them are New York Times best-selling writers. Uh, the rest of them are all award-winning, you know, huge name writers. Uh, a lot of them are crime writers because that that's, that tends to be, you know, who I'm friends with. So we've got Todd, uh, we've got Eric Story uh, from Colorado, we got uh, Chuck Box, CJ Box uh, from Wyoming, we've got Ingrid Dolph, uh, we've got Emma Walsh, uh, you know, we've got all of these all of these writers who wrote these essays about fishing, and they're all over the place. Some of you know, uh, and so Todd's is largely about uh, growing up in Kentucky, uh, going to spend time with with his grandparents. Uh, fishing there, but really it boils down to meeting this guy who basically turned his path. Uh, he wouldn't have you know, become what he became if he hadn't met this guy while he was there visiting his, his grandparents or something. And so it's essays all over the place, uh, you know, and it's not like big fish stories. It's not like, oh, I went here and this is how you do it and this is, uh, you know, it's nothing like that. It's essays about uh, about what it means to be human. It's essays about you know, just the world in, in general. Uh, and it's this gorgeous collection. It's called Gather at the River. Uh, it's coming out by a press called Hub City Press. They're a nonprofit. Uh, they're for, uh, based out of South Carolina. So the press is a nonprofit, and then all the royalties are going to uh, a charity called Cast for Kids, uh, which takes kids with disabilities and their caregivers fishing. Uh, and then they've actually got a couple other programs, one where they take uh, kids out of cities and take them fishing, and then one where they take military families fishing. <coughs> but all of these different programs that very much believe, you know, in putting people on the water. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about it uh, because I've, I've read every fishing book there is. Uh, I mean, and that's not an exaggeration. For a long time, I wanted to be like John G. Iraq. Uh, and I can say flat out that this is one of the best, the best collections I've ever encountered. Uh, period. Uh, I, I think it's a game changer when you when you look at when you look at uh, you know sporting literature. Uh, yes, it's going to be good. Yeah, I sent uh, Dave a picture that I had. My parents had. It was one of the few of me really young, and it's me holding up a fish that I caught in my grandparents' pond. Now both my my grandparents are, are gone. Um, and this is the only time that I, so far, have ever written about me personally, about my family, about Paducah, which is which is where I'm from. I still have family all around there. Um, and my parents uh, are more excited to read that. They haven't read it yet. So they're more excited to read that than the book I've got coming out next year. Because <laughs> it's about, you know, my dad's uh, side of the family. And uh, I haven't, haven't written about that before. So I can't wait to read all the other essays as well. But what book do you have? I mean, what... What's your next novel? I know you don't even want to give it away, but what, what are you kind of circling? What are you working on now? I'm pretty slow, uh, <laughs> for one, so 
I'm under contract for two novels, which is a really great thing. Uh, I'm in the mid, about halfway down with a novel called When These Mountains Burn. Um, it's set during the 2016 fires, uh, you know, when when all of those mountains were on fire, when we basically lost a bunch of Gatlinburg. Gatlinburg's not all that far. Uh, but it's largely about uh, heroin, and I think it's because uh, that has just become so prevalent at my house very, very suddenly. We tend to be kind of behind everybody else. It just takes about, I don't know, five, six years for us to, for things to really arrive there. Uh, but when I say it's in my front yard, it's in my front yard. I mean, I, that guy last week, uh, you know, that showed up in, in my front yard looking to buy some heroin. Maybe you need to paint the shutters and do something. <laughs> I, you know, the yard. Yeah, I was, I, and so I went to, or like I went to town one day, and there was nine needles oh. in the street. Or every gas station has sharps containers nowadays. Uh, one day I stopped to get gas, and uh, it was a Friday, and a, a painter, I guess he had met someone there and bought dope there, and he shot up in his van, there, and the cops was there, and his dead body in the van overdose there. So, I mean, it's in my face. Um, but maybe what's different about this novel is that I've always written about addicts, and it's because I know addicts, and it's because, you know, at one point in time, I was I was very close to being an addict if I wasn't flat out, you know, an addict myself. And so I know those people, uh, and I know, the, I know what goes through those heads, but uh, I've never really spent much time thinking about... Uh, people who are left in the wake of that. And so, you know, parents or, uh, or friends or, uh, you know, most of the time for me, if I, if I knew people, it, their parents were addicts too. Uh, but so I never spent much time thinking about that. So I, this novel, one of the main characters is a father whose son is an addict. Uh, and I think that's been really hard for me to write. And then there's another story of, of an addict, and these two stories kind of eventually, you know, twist together. Uh, but yeah, I think it's largely just become kind of this metaphor for what what we're losing in that place. I think we're a generation away from the death of that culture. I mean, I, I think that we are very much facing extinction. And I don't necessarily know that there's anything we can do about it. And I think we're within, you know, when I say a generation, I think we're within 20 years of, uh, of it being gone. Uh, and so this book is largely kind of about that, you know, and I think that's why I said it at the time I said it, because it feels like the world is burning down. Uh, maybe, I hope I get it right. You're probably the only person your age who even knows who the hell Hilda Dilda Doolittle was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I always loved, uh, she had all of these flower poems. So she had a poem called Sheltered Garden. And the idea behind Sheltered Garden was uh, the idea that all these people spend all this time uh, growing flowers and, and nurturing them and that these are everything has to be just right. It's like, oh, isn't it beautiful? And for her, no, it wasn't beautiful. Uh, for her, what was beautiful was like the dandelion. Uh, you know, it was the, it was the, it was the flower that, that grew out of bad circumstances. So then she had all of these poems like, uh, uh, you know, the sea rose or, uh, you know, all of, a lot of them were, were about flowers along the coast. But they kind of became like metaphors for women, for women I think. Uh, I think that's the kind of women that, that Hilda dug, you know? Uh, she, didn't want to, she didn't want some prissy ass woman who, uh, you know, had been coddled and who fit, who fit a certain thing. She wanted, uh, she wanted a woman who, who took life by the throat. Uh, I think maybe that's what I liked about her. Well, yeah, I'd just like to, to thank you both for a really great, great discussion. Yeah. Yeah, thank yeah. you all for coming. Yeah. Uh, a big sign. We'll have uh, both these guys right over here. Thanks, everybody online, too. You want us to do the chairs?
Oh, the chairs, yes. Would you mind uh, <laughs> 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 folding up your chair and uh, putting it against the wall? <laughs>